Hiya folks! A few months ago, at the behest of YouTuber XFactor, I did a video showing off my gaming and editing PC. A card for it should pop up here, and you can click on it and watch it if you'd like. I'll also leave a, a link for it in the description down below. I'm going to use this video to go over a lot of the same things and explain all the stuff that's changed and why. Now if you've watched my previous video already, you'll note that quite a few things have changed about my entire office, the setup, the desk, and the PC case. I'll address each of those things in time. The first big and most obvious change is that I actually have a real desk now. I got rid of that big metal behemoth. The Obato Revolution desk was one of those seemed like a good idea at the time sort of things. Even though it provided an excellent way to mount a joystick, throttle, rudder pedals, and the keyboard and mouse, I found that getting into and out of it was just too much of a challenge and uncomfortable. I also missed having real tabletop space, so I decided to dump the entire mess and return to a real desk. But I went all out and got a new Uplift L-shaped corner desk. If you're not familiar with Uplift, they build these awesome desk lift systems. You can actually just buy the legs and motor control system and mount your own tabletop to it if you want. Or you can have them build you an entire desk, which is what I did here. I made sure that it was plenty large enough to handle all of my displays, the mixer, amp, and whatever else I needed, with a little space left over for the laptop and whatnot. This L-Desk measures 84 inches from the far corner against the wall to each end. The desk surface is 30 inches deep. And, with a push and hold of a memory button, the desk will raise right up to the standing position for me. Another memory button will drop it back down to the sitting position. On the right of the desk is where the cables leave it and head towards the PC. I have to leave some slack in them so that there's enough room to raise and lower the desk without either crushing the cables or pulling them from their spots. Some of these analog cables are literally just three foot jumpers and they aren't long enough to run down through the grommet holes and back towards the PC. That's why they're all on top versus underneath. Overall, I'm quite pleased with the uplift. And I found a solution for the joystick problem that involves a clamp and attachment point from a company called Monster Tech in Germany. Once I begin playing games that require joysticks, I'll mount them up and start using them again. But for now, it's just the keyboard and mouse. The second most noteworthy change is the PC case. This is a Case Labs Magnum THW10 case. Case Labs is a small company out in California that custom builds every case they sell. There's generally a three to four month wait when you order a case from them as they fabricate everything about the case. Hell, I got my new car faster than that. But it comes to you flat packed in a box that belies the overall size of the case. The reason is you have to assemble everything. That means all the panels are individually packed and need to be assembled. Case Lab's primary goal is to provide the case for over the top water cooling. They don't come cheap. This case, with options, cost me about 900 bucks. I'm not dropping money numbers to brag, just to let you know that the cost of entry is steep were you considering trying to follow my footsteps. But I can't recommend these Case Labs case enough. They're literally perfect. You do pay for them, though. Now, given how I have this set up, I have to move this table that the tower is on so that I can open the side door. But that's okay, as I don't need to do it often. But let's open her up and take a look more closely at what's in here, and I'll acknowledge some of the cooling while I'm at it. The first big thing with the Magnum case is its massive size. It lives up to its name. It's cavernous inside here. Far more than enough room for big motherboards and all the water cooling you could ever possibly want to do. As you can see, the motherboard mounts here, but look closely and you'll see that that's actually a tray. On the back of this case, there's a big handle with four captive bolts. When I mounted the motherboard, all I had to do was remove this tray, install the board and the PCI cards onto that tray, and then slid the tray back into the case. Done. Easy peasy. If I ever need to do any work on the board in the future, I just need to disconnect the cooling, the electrical, and SATA cables, and it'll pop right out of the back of the case. On this side of the case, I have two intake fans up front and one exhaust fan attached to the motherboard tray. These and the case fans on the other side are Noctua NFS-12A 120mm fans, 
five of them in total. The CPU cooling loop is pretty simple. It's fed by an EK140 Revo D5 pump and res combo into an EK Supremacy Evo Elite CPU block. From there, it's up to the Alpha Cool 480mm by 60mm radiator that's cooled by eight Noctua NFF12 120mm fans in a push pull config. After the water egresses the radiator, it returns to the reservoir. The GPU cooling starts with another EK140 Revo pump res combo, which feeds into the EK Titan X GPU blocks. The GPUs are connected in parallel for cooling, and the egress is right out of the same card. Once it egresses, the water flows through the bottom of the case and over to the other side. The Magnum case is considered a double wide, and here you can see why. It's literally the same size width-wise as the main side. I have the Corsair AX1500i power supply mounted here, feeding the entire system. Below the power supply is where the water line comes in from the GPUs on the other side. It enters this massive Alpha Cool 560mm by 60mm radiator on the bottom of the case. The radiator is cooled by 8 Noctua NFA14 140mm fans in another push-pull configuration. You can't actually see the bottom four fans here. They hang below the floor of the case. But that's why I have these big 3-inch casters on the case. The case needs ground clearance. The water egresses the big rad and heads up into another Alpha Cool 480mm by 60mm radiator, which is also cooled by 8 Noctua NFF12 120mm fans in another push-pull config. Once it egresses the rad on the top, it returns to the main side and into the reservoir. How am I controlling these pumps and fans? I have two Aqua Aero 6 XT PWM controllers mounted on the front of the case, one on each side. The one on the left is just controlling the CPU pump and eight fans that are cooling the CPU. Each of the eight fans are connected into a SwiftTech 1-8 PWM splitter, and that splitter is then connected to the Aqua Arrow. The Aqua Arrow on the right controls the GPU pump, the two radiators worth of fans, and the case fans. Again, each combination of those fans, or rather each collection of those fans, is connected to their own SwiftTech PWM splitter. You can see the intake filters on the front here. Those are aftermarket as Case Labs does not provide filters. It's up to each buyer to figure out where they want intake and exhaust and to buy their own filters for their respective cases. The filters you see here are from a company called Dempsey Flex. They're based in South Africa and they custom cut filters for as many PC cases as they know of. They send filters with stick-on ferrous material just in case you're using a non-ferrous case such as the aluminum in the Case Labs. The filters can pop off, can be popped off easily, cleaned, and snapped back on. Up top, this cover comes right off easily, which exposes the top rads and fans. Look along here and you can see the thumb screws next to each rad. What these thread into are brackets that attach directly to each radiator, sandwiched between the radiator and the top side fans. What this provides is an easy way to mount the radiator and fans outside of the case and then with no effort whatsoever, attach the whole unit to the case. Also along the top here are slots for the fan cables. It's a very elegant solution that is literally the best thing I've ever seen for radiator and fan mounting. Let's talk about the PC hardware inside the case. It hasn't changed much. I'm still rocking with the Asus Rampage 5 Extreme motherboard and an Intel 5960X CPU that's been overclocked to 4.3 GHz. The system still has 64GB of DDR4 RAM and two Titan X Pascal GPUs that are also overclocked. By the way, those Titan cards are the first generation of the Pascal Titan X cards, not the newest ones they just released the other day. In other words, the GIMP ones. For storage, a bit has changed since the last video. I did finally get my Samsung 960 Pro 1TB NVMe drive, which you can't really see too well because it's in a slot perpendicular to the video cards underneath them. That's the drive I use for the operating system and applications. The previous system drive, a Samsung SM951 500GB M.2 drive, is inside one of the PCIe cards mounted on the board. That's the one I primarily use for video editing scratch space. Two Samsung 2TB 850s are striped together into a 4TB volume for projects, and they sit under two off-label 4TB 
hard disks that are striped into an 8 terabyte volume for video recording. For displays, I'm still using the same 27 inch Asus ROG PG278Q panel as my primary, and it's flanked by two inexpensive ARIA 27 inch 1440p IPS panels. When I play games, I only use the center display. The other two are used to display other things such as streaming chat, TeamSpeak, Discord, or what have you. Another massive change in the system is the overall audio subsystem. Still here is the Sound Blaster ZXR card in the PC and the big Rode Broadcaster mic that I'm using full time now. And of course, the unearthly Sennheiser HD800 headphones are what deliver that audio to my hyper-tuned ears. But that's where everything changes. Tying the audio together is this mixer from Mackie, a DL806. It's an 8 channel in, 6 channel out digital mixer. All inputs and outputs are analog. The only controls on the mixer itself are the gain knobs for each input and the output volume for the headphone jack if you're using it. Everything else is controlled by their iPad app, which you see running on my iPad off to the left of my keyboard with an easy reach. The mixer provides a slot right on its top that you can attach the iPad directly to if you want to, and it'll control the mixer via the lightning port. However, the mixer also has a Cat5 network port on its back, and you can connect that to a local LAN if you want. That's how I have it connected. The iPad is also on the same LAN via wireless. As soon as the Mackie app fires up, it sees the mixer via the network and can control it real time. This is key regarding the digital aspect of the mixer. Everything is controlled via the iPad app except the input gain, all the faders, effects, internal routing, and everything. As an aside, you'll see in my previous vid that I once had an RME Babyface Pro mixer. I somewhat outgrew that, and I also didn't care as much for the control software that RME wrote. The Mackie is far more feature rich and costs a bunch less money than the Babyface Pro. The Babyface isn't a bad mixer, it just wasn't quite enough for me. So I sold it. Now, how do I have this all connected together? This is going to seem like overkill, but as the Mythbusters say, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. The boom mic obviously connects to the first input and it gets its phantom power from the mixer. Inputs three and four are bound together and are from the Sound Blaster's RCA outputs. Channels left and right are connected accordingly, and to keep it straight, I use red masking tape to denote the right channel. Channels 5 and 6 are also bound together, and they're from the headphone output of the iPad. Now if the iPad is directly connected to the mixer, it can send sound output through the lightning port and the mixer recognize it, recognizes it as a separate channel. But a remote iPad has no way to do that through the network. So I have to use the headphone port. When I'm streaming, I keep the Slacker Internet Radio app running in the background. I mute it and unmute it, when I'm playing, between breaks, gameplay, etc. The mixer's outputs are connected as follows. The first two are bound together into a left-right pair, including the red tape of course, and fed into this Zoom U44 mixer. The Zoom's only job is to take an analog input from the mixer and convert it to a digital output. It then feeds the output to the Sound Blaster's optical toss link input, and that's how I transmit from my mic. Again, I don't like the Sound Blaster's built-in ADC because of its noise floor. I'd rather some other device convert the analog signal to digital and then feed it to the Sound Blaster. It's much cleaner that way. Another pair of outputs are bonded together and fed into this beast of a headphone amp, the Sennheiser HDVA600. I can't use this video to explain the difference between balanced and unbalanced audio sync connections. It's an exercise I'm going to leave to the viewer but just know that this connection from the mixer to the amp is balanced, and the special headphone cable connecting the cans to the amp is also balanced. What that means is that what's pumped to my ears is 100% clean. No hiss, no extraneous noise, nothing. And finally, the mixer's mains are bonded together and fed back to the Sound Blaster's RCA input. This is what I send the music from my iPad to, which gets captured by OBS Studio running on Windows, and transmitted to my streams. Now this does rely on the Sound Blaster's ADC, but I'm okay with that. Remember, I know this is massive overkill. I've spent about five grand on audio hardware and cabling in total, including the sound card, the amp, the cans, etc. 
Five grand is more than most people spend on their entire PC. Yes, I realize that. But my ears can hear the difference. And to me, it's worth it. It might not be to you though. So I can't recommend you just run out and reproduce everything I did here. You might not understand or appreciate the difference. And that's not meant as an insult. That's the system in a not so nutshell. Future changes will include a new Ergotron HX LCD arm that they just released. And it's not available through any retailers yet. But when they are, I'll pick up three of them and get the LCDs off the surface of the desk. I won't be upgrading anything motherboard or CPU related in the system for the time being. Yes, the 5960X is an aging processor, but it makes little sense to upgrade it right now. Intel is right on the cusp of replacing the X99 chipset with what I think they're going to call the X299. That will require new motherboards, new CPUs with new pinouts, and everything. Once those are announced in shipping, I'll start upgrading, but not until then. And I'm glad you've made it this far. I sincerely appreciate your time and patience. Hopefully everything is clear about what I have here, but if there's any questions at all, don't hesitate to ask. Post them in the comment section. I will read them and answer them to the best of my abilities. And also, if you don't like what you see, go right ahead and comment on that as well. They will be read and possibly replied to. Thanks for stopping by and I'll catch you later.